Hello, dear colleagues, and welcome to the event organized by the Center for Economic Strategy, VT and Excise, harmonizing taxes with the EU without harming Ukrainian businesses. I am Natalia Spihotska. I am president of CFA Society Ukraine and uh, deputy head of analytical department of Dragon Capital. And this is my honor today to moderate this event. In the first part of the event, economists of the Center of uh, Economic Strategies will present the survey on what could change in taxation of Ukrainians after Ukraine exceeds the EU. And then we will cover some aspects of the research and prospects of integration with uh, the participants of our today's panel discussion. So technically, today we are going to speak Ukrainian, but there is interpretation into English. You can use your interpretation function in the bottom of the Zoom panel. And if you have questions to the speakers, please write them in the Q&A section. And it's also in the bottom. And the speakers will be in the position to answer the questions during the event or at the end of the event after the Q&A session and also at the end of the session our audience will have the opportunity to join the discussion with the open microphone free microphone uh, rules and the survey and the presentation are organized with the financial support of the EU and media partner of the event is Economichna Pravda. Today we start by presenting Yuri Haidai's uh, research as senior economist of the Center for Economic Research on harmonization of the tax policy with the EU, uh, the frame and opportunities for Ukraine. Thank you for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you for this introduction. And I'm also grateful to everyone who have joined us today online. And uh, then let's proceed so that we have more time for discussion further on. So let me try and uh, come up with quite a detailed review of what is implied by harmonization with the EU tax policy and how what kind of effect we could expect with the focus on the harmony, uh, EU harmonized system. So all in all, we need to keep in mind that until recently, the EU I mean, until the beginning of the full-scale aggression, most Europeans considered the EU as the economic union, as the single internal market, a territory without borders uh, inside. And the objective of the EU in the future is to provide for free movement of goods, individual services and capital, as it happens within any individual country. And currently, the situation has changed a little bit. Europeans are reconsidering their values, but we are moving along this paradigm so far. We need to keep in mind that all tax regulation, not, and not only uh, over the national in the EU, what's said by the European Commission and the European Parliament, that's about free domestic market or internal market. Based on that, the direct taxation policy is a responsibility of the member states. The European Union only sets certain individual harmonized standards for taxation of enterprises and individuals in view of providing for the principles of the EU single market to avoid double taxation, for example, while indirect taxation is much more regulated. But now we will speak about that in more detail. And the main instrument there is the European directives, which establish the general principles and frames for application of indirect taxes, as well as the mechanisms, and that's important mechanisms for derogating from the general frame available to member states. And also there are regulations or bylaws that are that uh, uh, regulates certain details for EU directive implementation and practical implementation of indirect taxation within the framework of uh, the uh, harmonized uh, provisions as well, uh, as well remains the prerogative of member states. So indirect taxes and uh, the specific feature of those. So they are set as a cap on the end price of a 
um, product or service, and thus they they are not harmonized. They have that has a significant impact on the market. There may be some competitive, uh, unfair competitive advantages, and that requires harmonization. Above all, that's about uh, VAT and excises. So if we don't consider the uh, social contributions, that's the main source of uh, tax source for the EU budgets. 13.8% of GDP in 2021 was uh, contributed uh, um, by taxes on production and import, which is a bit more than taxation of revenue, capital, and other groups of taxes. The national legislation of EU member states is based on the European Directive on the Common uh, VAT system, which establishes the rates, exemptions from VAT, and also derogations, and uh, describes special um, schemes. And we will also cover all of these items, and we will try to focus on what we believe would be more interesting. Currently, the EU has a transitional VAT system. That's interesting. When the EU was established, they, not even the EU, but the economic uh, community, Commonwealth, uh, it was expected that they would uh, base on the principle of the country of origin. But eventually there were some political contradictions and currently the EU is moving towards the VAT system that as when it is launched uh, uh, in the single market based on the principle of the destination country. But some of the transactions are still exem exemptions. That is why this is transitional system. Speaking about rates, so member states are required to apply the standard rate, but they can determine the size of it, observing the following conditions. The rate cannot be less than 15% of the taxable amount, and it needs to be the same, must be the same for all transactions for supply of goods and services. Um, maximum two reduced rates can be applied or none, actually, under the current, uh, the following conditions. The rate is no less than 5%, and reduced rates are only applicable to goods and services listed in Annex 3 of the European Directive. And uh, the a limitation is no more than 24 items of the annex. Mostly these are goods that are considered to provide for basic needs. And this is food, water, medicines, pharmaceuticals, some cultural items. And here it is important that after adoption of the directive on April the 5th, 2022, the member states also are able to set a rate below 5%, the super low uh, rate or apply exemption. Uh, from a VAT with the possibility of crediting the input tax credit for which is important when we speak about uh, VAT exemption, it is important to take the tax credit uh, uh, into account. Why that happened? Well, usually the orthodox approach is about that the fewer the rates, the more transparent the system is. In its uh, justification, the European Commission states that in the process of digitalization of VAT administration and the transition to the system of uh, transition to um, of uh, uh, taxation at the place of destination, there will be less difficulties with diversified rates, and the EU believes it's reasonable to expand the opportunity scope for businesses of member states. And there are a lot of EU countries that have grant been granted the right to temporary derogations from the general rules for a transitional period with uh, the aim of gradually bringing national legislation, tax legislation in compliance with requirements of VAT directive. And that uh, some derogations are established geographically due to some social economic factors. For example, Greece is an interesting example. In 2018, they requested and they received approval of the European Commission for derogation for lower VAT rates, 30% lower than the standard for some islands and archipelagos that are located 
in the sea between Turkey and Greece. And their argument was the migration crisis, significant impact uh, on this islands by illegal migrants, that they place those migrants there in those islands. And uh, Greece agreed to continue uh, hosting these uh, uh, migrants if they have these benefits from the EU. But it is important that all of these derogations, they undergo very um, detailed analysis. And the country that applies for this derogation needs to prove that this derogation will not impact competition uh, in the single market of the EU and uh, that geographically or based on quotas, the reduction to 4, 9 and 17 uh, percent uh, of uh, VAT, as in Greece, for example, that it will not uh, impact uh, tax uh, revenues in other countries of the EU. And all of these extensions or derogations, they are usually set for a certain limited period of time and they need to be expanded after it is analyzed whether the conditions that uh, uh, are rational for derogation are still in place and whether they create negative consequences. So speaking about derogations, Chapter 9 of the European Directive uh, offers a, a broad list of transactions for which member states are obliged to apply uh, exemptions from VAT. These are goods and services in the public interest, state postal services, education, medicine. For education, it may even be about private tutors uh, who work in the framework of the state educational program. I will not dwell on that, that there is a long list of exemptions, but let me cover something else in a more detail. And then exemptions, derogations, as we mentioned, and uh, what that mechanism looks like. States may receive from the European Council the uh, authorization to have a derogation based on the article, uh, based on article 395 and the main uh, motivation would be simplifying VAT collection for the tax authority and also uh, regarding the load, the burden on business and also to prevent tax evasion and avoidance. And actually, based on this opportunity, most countries, all countries actually, who currently in the EU have introduced digital reporting on VAT transactions digital reporting requirements in this or that form, all of them requested such derogation because currently the directive has not yet, well, it was designed in view of paper exchange and uh, no electronic administration is anticipated. So these are derogations currently, but the situation will change soon. And measures aimed at simplifying the VAT collection procedure should not reduce the tax, re uh, tax revenues of the member state significantly. So it is not possible to receive a derogation that has a significant negative impact on tax revenues where the tax base or tax rates are significantly reduced. And examples of such derogations, that's DRR. We will speak about that in more detail. Expanded schemes for small businesses, we'll also discuss that. And rate reduction for certain services with a significant share of labor in the cost price. And then the VAT is close to um, tax on turnover. Hairdressers, restaurants, home care, this is where derogations can be requested by member states and special schemes now. Currently in the EU, there are three special schemes for small businesses. This is simplified uh, collection, uh, estimation and collection of VAT. And a bit later, we will speak about farmers and flat rate, rate scheme where member states can implement that after consultations with the VAT committee of the Council of Europe. And then, uh, then Exemption from VAT, we will discuss that a bit later. Member states can exempt businesses with an annual turnover less than a certain amount from VAT. 
and uh, they uh, this exemption is voluntary uh, small businesses can choose simplified or normal VAT system and uh, uh, and uh, the uh, if uh, businesses are not fully exempt from VAT the state may introduce some privileges where only part of the turnover is uh, exempted and this increases as the this benefit increases as the turnover increases now only a couple of countries use this benefits and this is not popular um, maybe because it is difficult to administer it uh, and the small businesses need to assess to understand how it works if it is beneficial but there is this possibility and it is interesting that the current provisions of the pd of the vat directive that said this um, regulations for the turnover uh, uh, they were introduced by back in 1987 uh, 77 so that was available for a uh, small uh, businesses uh, that were uh, had a turnover lower than a certain threshold and the states that joined the eu later the limit of this exemption or simplification for small businesses was set based on results of negotiations and uh, uh, Malta used to bargain 37,000 euros, which is the biggest, but that's a small country which has a lot of specific aspects and it uh, is allowed a lot of derogations. And of course, such limitations from 10 to 37,000 euros was, were not um, sufficient and most countries then uh, re-contacted the European Commission in order to increase the annual turnover limit for small businesses. And all of these derogations, they are temporary, they are extended for the period of two to three years and they extended with the decision of the European Commission. As of now, as of the 1st of April actually, 2020, the highest turn, annual turnover limits for uh, tax exemption, VAT exemption, were those of uh, Czech Republic, Hungary, Italy, and Poland, 85,000 euros, and Romania, 88.5 thousand. And you can see the comparative chart for the five new EU members, Croatia, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Estonia, and the limits that they bargained when they joined the single market and they um, relevant uh, limit uh, till the end of the year for example croatia was okay with uh, 45000 and romania set almost 90 then this is quite a specific and maybe not quite clear for most ukrainians i mean not familiar uh, scheme uh, for farmers and this is the flat rate this is a special scheme to make it easier for farmers where even application of standard vat or special schemes for small businesses may cause difficulties and such farmers are exempted from uh, vat and in order to compensate for the loss of the credit uh, tax credit and uh, to avoid any abuse of VAT, the flat rate applies to their transactions. It is calculated based on statistical data, the average tax uh, um, load for this segment. Uh, for example, if it is aqua, culture or fishery or other types of farm farming, and they have their this flat rate and the rate is either added by farmers to their VAT credit based on the invoices or on the bills that are issued by farmers and the farmers um, get these funds in order to compensate the uh, input uh, VAT that they paid and uh, the buyers clients can issue those bills to the farmers and they this can be the grounds for compensating VAT for the state and there is a number of limitations to control possibilities of abuse and these uh, rates are notified by EU member states and the European Commission keeps an eye on that uh, it is uh, doesn't turn into subsidies uh, for the agrarian sector because that affects competition. 
Now I am coming to some interesting, uh, like, uh, view to the future. If I'm not mistaken, on 8th December last year, the Euro Commission presented the uh, VAT in the digital age, which is practically aiming to update, make more modern VAT system in the single market of EU. And it is aiming to also address a uh, few main problem. I split them into this report, same like your commission did it. I did nothing new here. What is the matter? As I already mentioned early, as of now, 12 uh, uh, members use one or other form of uh, digital reporting. Uh, for uh, VAT transactions, which may happen in the so-called uh, continuous reporting regime, the invoicing which Italy has introduced and France is moving towards it, or real-time reporting, which is Spain and Hungary have introduced, or it may be a regular periodic uh, reporting with the standard file, standard audit file, but uh, let the, the name standard audit file not confuse you. OECD described it as a standard format for report, uh, tax reporting. There are different in all the countries. In Poland, there are seven of such forms, uh, one for VAT and six for other taxes. And here, I believe a good intent of this standardization to harmonize was lost in, in the course. But as of today, Poland, Portugal, and Lithuania use uh, this soft skill reporting, and there is a VAT safety reporting, and there is a VAT listing when, from the list of all transactions. The VAT is uh, submitted uh, per counter agents and per transactions, one per one. And obviously, when there is a single market and a trade made within it, uh, such a fragmented and uh, obsolete system of uh, reporting creates certain problem. I have still eight minutes right to stay within them. What is the first problem? It is the cost for business. Talking about the small business working within a country, it is not so burdensome. According to VT and Digital Age, a substantial report which was prepared for Euro Commission based on which this package was also developed, which is proposed the cost of VT reporting administration makes for small businesses 200 to 500 euro a year for larger companies it might be 15,000 euro and the largest problem is in is international companies because if you have business in all the countries of the EU and uh, meet different uh, forms of reporting in 12 countries it becomes very costly because you have to do it in each country in different way and the assessment of uh, the cost of non-efficient uh, ways in the EU on all this is 1.6 billion euro. If it would be the only problem, the Euro Commission wouldn't uh, be so fast with the solution. But the larger problem is early loss from fraud. There is a scheme when it's difficult to match the transactions between countries. And there is a whole story with recapitulated statements, the so-called reverse reporting on the transactions between EU member countries, export between EU member members. It enables tax fraud to happen, including the carousel fraud among between several countries. And the laws from such carousel fraud are assisted. 20 to 27 billion euro. What has been proposed? I'll tell you that all the decisions uh, concerning tax policy have to be agreed, approved uh, unanimously by uh, EU member countries. And the Euro Commission 
tries to improve and develop taxation system very carefully because somebody uses it for political trade out of connection with the tax. But uh, VAT, digital age, is a very demand change. So it, there is a very high political chance of them being improved. And as of today, they have already passed first hearing in the um, Euro Parliament uh, Tax Committee. So it is worth to dwell on them more in detail. Obviously, it will also be it will be introduced in the nearest years in the Euro in the EU. Maybe even uh, quicker than we will have the chance to join the EU. This is introduction of a harmonized requirements to digital standardization transaction without preliminary transactions with tax authorities because it is in the system where you may not send an electronic invoice to counter agent before being it being approved by tax authorities in ukrainian realities it is scaring and well but it will not happen in you as well without an approval the standard standardized electronic invoices for b2b transactions and supplies to the market between the countries in the first stage uh, obligatory digital report, reporting and the system of recopulative statements. It is being believed that the refusal from those obsolete uh, reporting forms will have to balance uh, the costs for tax administration to reduce those burdens for different kinds of business. The second topic is uh, putting in order the economic platform. It's an important story. Uh, talking about how the platforms are growing, which are intermediaries between sales, buyers, and suppliers of services, there is a number of examples. As an electronic marketplace uh, similar to our Rosetta or Amazon, it may be a platform for services like Ukrainian Kabanchik and many, many others. Already in 2019, the incomes of this union uh, of this ecosystem was taken together as the providers of the platforms those who provide uh, services and sell uh, goods for them was 250 billion euro, 258 uh, euro. After the crisis, this number is even more. Those are substantial income. And uh, it comes to 50 billion euros. Those changes will be introduced. What is the problem? The problem is very similar to what is in Ukraine. Difficulties with uh, uh, identifying uh, the place of supply and uh, the violation of supplies neutrality. What is meant? Many small businesses work through platforms and they do use simplified schemes which we introduced to help small businesses, which has no network effect and scaling effect scale-up effect, but uh, this uh, small business uses uh, the network effect and scale effect of the platform themselves. It may, they may achieve good results and use the VAT exemption at the same time, which uh, makes it without, and it's made without sufficient control by the state. The state approaches uh, at certain level to this business, and uh, such non-harmonization results in uh, excessive costs and tax uncertainty. What the EU proposed accordingly? The services of the platforms will be qualified as intermediary services. Uh, as of today, most of member countries regard them as electronic one, but those will be services of the platform to uh, tax non-payers. Uh, they will be qualified as intermediary services, and the place of supply will be in the transaction, the place of the transaction itself, where to the goods is uh, submitted or the services uh, provided to, uh, and the introduction of uh, relevant segment like uh, booking.com or ride-sharing Accordingly, if service supplier is not a VAT payer, VAT will be charged and paid by the intermediary platform itself. Later on, this supplier regime will be expanded to all B2B, B2C uh, uh, 
platforms for goods manufactured in EU and expansion of single window for importers. It's not, I have no time to talk about this one stop shop. And it is being expanded, it is a good feedback feedbacks about how good this all is, is, uh, is for the business. What is, is this? This is a possibility for a company, a business to be registered as a taxpayer in one point using one-stop shop scheme without having a need to uh, register as a VAT payer in all the EU countries. If he is out of uh, supply limit, which was earlier 10,000 euro, euro for that, after that, you should become a supplier in another country. After all SS implementation, you can register here and continue to work with the final consumer. For B2B earlier, there was a possibility not to register. There was a mechanism of reverse charge. Now talking about excise, very generally, in the EU, there is a harmonized system of excise for energy, alcoholic beverage, alcohol and uh, tobacco products. Specific uh, provisions for each segment are in separate directives. You can look at them. There regard, first of all, the race and certain specifics of the uh, application. Overall provisions are in the directive of on excise and this is a separate religion and bible of excise warehouses turn over between them the exemptions for release of this excise goods uh, there should be a separate one hour round table uh, conducted to describe all this but on top of those alcohol and tobacco groups the states might introduce the excise for other localized uh, uh, goods uh, like uh, excise for damaged sugar uh, in uk which is not your member uh, and also for excessive content of salt also excise for um, beverages tear and uh, in poland there is an excess for cars and in german excise for coffee it is historic as long as i understand the experience of uh, simplified schemes for a small uh, alcohol producers have been increased in 20 in the year 20 substantially for example the directive which uh, modernized as a business. It's very conservative on the excise. It was changed only twice when new members were accepted to EU. These changes established the possibility for the states to reduce alcohol excises for small batches uh, produced, uh, manufactured uh, independently by small manufacturers, uh, which might have early certificate uh, for their status to be confirmed and the requirements they are very strictly prescribed for them to get the certificate and some states can allow self-certification of the manufacturers for those who self-check for that if they are not if they are cheating they will be a relative consequences also reduce rates for fruit and ethylic alcohol was established if you for example are manufacturing or growing fruits in uh, Sicilia, you may have a privileged uh, mode to convert them into traditional drinks based upon fruit alcohol. In the same way, uh, there can be excise uh, exemption or reduced rates for uh, alcohol. To get such exemptions, uh, you have to go to the Euro Commission for approval. Earlier, there was regulation for such beverages, but uh, I, I may talk a long time for this, but I have my time out, so I have it to give the floor to our round table participants. For the few, there is a directive establishing minimal excise rates and the maximum one are to the discretion of the state. You can see the current rates, for example, for motor fuel are twice 
on three times higher than those valid will be valid in ukraine after first of july when the exercises for fuel will be renewed as i remember there'll be 175 euro for 1000 liters of benzene and you see here the table self-speaking table there's a significant difference in the rates between eu and ukraine and all this will be a, an object of transition uh, provisions which will allow to gradually change excise rates and not to produce shock for population and businesses by adding at one in one moment 300 euro for 1000 dollars that's all here i want to give the floor to natalia our facilitator and the invited guests of the round table thank you I produced a very brief review. You can see more in the report. I know whether it was already published in our CES uh, website. I put the links to the sources uh, so you can go more in depth for it to be an entry point to for yourself to study, to search uh, direct and direct taxes. Uh, information in EU and the difference with Ukraine and the possibility for Ukraine to preserve some flexibility of taxation policy within Euro integration, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri, for very detailed and interesting presentation. I do agree with you that for each, uh, each issue of your presentation, a separate event could be organized, but we'll continue our discussion trying to answer a question, what will it mean for Ukraine, taking into account our ambitions for your integration. And now I want to introduce to you the speakers who will join our discussion. Danilo Hetmanov, Chairman of Verkhovna Rada's Committee on Finance, Tax and Customs Policy, and Ray Baron, Senior Advisor of uh, EUM in Ukraine, Kirill Nominas, Inspector of uh, Business Ombudsman Council, and Hope Maria Sonnek will join us, Senior Lecturer at the Lund Faculty, a researcher of taxation system of the European Union. I thank a lot all the speakers who joined us today and the first question today we would like to address to Danilo Hetmanov. Danilo Alexandrovich, uh, hope you are with us. Do you hear us? Uh, good afternoon, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us today and the first question we would like to ask you uh, is where do you see uh, larger difficulties and challenges uh, in harmonization of Ukrainian taxation system to EU requirements? How much shall we harmonize? A lot, a lot really shall we have to harmonize. In our committee, we made analytics of your integration and all the directions of our activities, financial relations, customs and taxation, and taxes is as a less harmonized uh, system which requires largest work, difficult work. And as uh, working with details, because uh, really I want to thank Yuri for such a cool presentation, professional one. We all do see that uh, the system of taxation First of all, as regards VAT in EU is quite different from ours. That is why basically the implementation of the above said provisions require requires not just a blind uh, copy paste into our legislation, it requires uh, making aware of those uh, norms is uh, so thoughtful approach and a significant transition period which would allow us to implement them in a quality manner and also to meet expectations of the business uh, which have certain illusion as regards taxation system in EU. The main obstacle, as a matter of fact, and the main problem connected with implementation is exactly this, those illusions. Because 
because it is believed that the level of taxation control, who knows why, is lower in Ukraine than in Ukraine. It is believed that uh, the level of uh, inclusion in tax authorities to VAT administration is also lower and uh, milder. But actually, we can see even based on the recent presentation that that's not so not right. And the second question, of course, is this discussion about rates that never ends. Unfortunately, we have oh, it's quite popular in our country. And the discussion about reduced taxation about sort of unique uh, conditions for the tax system of Ukraine. But actually, this is quite damaging for the European integration process. We need to keep in mind that if we want to be a EU member state, we need to undertake to agree to the conditions that exist in the EU. Besides, of course, I would hold European integration based on the project, uh, the draft directives that are considered by the EU today to avoid the situation where we need to undertake the complex path of the other member states, but just to join the single rules of taxation in the EU at the current phase or even looking into the future, into the short term future, so that we could step over this period of time that it took them to analyze their own mistakes and uh, when they made mistakes and tried to learn from their mistakes. And it's obvious, of course, that we don't have any other way, no other alternative. That's not political choice, that's about survival. That is why we cannot but do that, we cannot but we cannot replace that with something else or try to um, speak to pretend it doesn't exist or to find some loopholes. Now, we need to keep in mind that quality implementation of those provisions, above all, that form our own benefit. The most difficult question to me is the question of the transitional period. And this provisions, this relations day will be unique for Ukraine. And there we need to use all the intellectual resources that we have available in our country, in the EU as well, in order to make that transition period as little painful for us as possible and to avoid some possible abuse, some mistakes or uh, impediments for businesses, where we, well, frankly speaking, don't know how to do that. And we need to learn that together, actually, to develop that skill, this knowledge. All together, we will structure our transition period, but there is nothing impossible. We understand that that needs to be done and definitely we will do that. Thank you so much. So just to sum up, if I hear you right, that you believe that the greatest risk is uh, unjustified expectations about future administering of indirect taxes and the rates after the future integration in the EU. Oh, yes. I know the general attitude, and I believe that this unjustified and too high expectations about 
a lower level of tax control, more freedom for businesses. And in the tax relations, I'm sure that will produce the opposition to resistance to European integration and implementation of those provisions. But that's about awareness raising, communication, that's for us to do. I cannot but agree with you, and thank you so much. Now I'd like to pass the floor to continue the discussion to Andriy Baran. Andriy, are you here? Let's wait for a half a minute. Andrei, can you hear us? Okay, while we'll try to reconnect with Andrei, let's continue the discussion. And here, Mr. Kirill, Inspector of the Council of Business Ombudsperson. Hello, colleagues, and thank you for this opportunity to come up with my ideas about this topic. This is a very interesting presentation. This is a helicopter view presentation, but really it offers quite a good vision for Ukrainian businesses in particular of the situation in Europe and what we should expect so that we did not have those illusions. And maybe we don't have illusions because quite a significant part of Ukrainian businesses because of full-scale full aggression had the experience of working in the EU. Some started working there on the permanent basis, some only temporarily, but anyway, people have already come in contact with their system, with how they work, how the taxation, administration of taxes works. So if we speak about the topic of today's presentation, I'd like to emphasize VAT in digital age theme, because as mentioned by Danilo, we need to be guided by what is going to happen in the EU in the future, not what we have now, because otherwise we'll lose time harmonizing with certain situation and then we will realize that we are lagging behind. There are international projects helpful for Ukraine that pay a lot of attention to that. In particular, that's about customs legislation, for example. They say that we shouldn't be guided by the current situation only. We need to be guided by the situation as it will be. The EU is a customs union above all. And we need to keep in mind that if we speak about customs relations, the reforms in the EU will be uh, will cover larger range than range than VAT invoicing as well. In May this year, they presented the offers of the reforms, and I understand, and that's just my understanding, but based on open data, it follows that the EU has proper understanding of that the current situation where there are 27 customs administrations and like hundreds of software products that uh, companies need to use when they have customs clearance under different import and export conditions, that's not good for the EU. They are planning to develop a one data hub. so the digital reform will be huge. And this VT in digital age and implementing invoicing in the entire EU territory, this is the vector that the EU will probably stick to. And here we need to keep in mind whether we are ready for that to hand towards this objective and where we are now. It was very interesting in Yuri's presentation and that he suggested this sub-categorization types of DRR regarding reporting, digital reporting. In the analysis of the regulatory impact on the website uh, of the European Commission, it is available, you can download that. There is subdivision by various countries. For example, Italy, that a lot of changes expected. So they subdivide this uh, digital reporting into two subtypes, and this is periodical reporting and the ongoing reporting. And uh, ongoing reporting is uh, uh, also subdivided, for example, invoicing uh, and uh, 
other formats, but most likely based on the presentations, based on analysis of the regulatory impact, we see that e-invoicing will be implemented, most likely in customs uh, uh, relations as well, and Ukraine needs to be guided by that. The place of Ukraine now is hard to determine. It seems that we have uh, e-reporting, we have tax invoicing, but if we speak about how it works in Italy, well, this is very different from that. Let me explain the difference. For example, if two businesses sign a contract for um, supplies, we sign a contract, specification, application from the buyer, the invoice, then the bill, TTN, and all in all it is six documents, and all of those documents are printed. Everything needs to be printed. So we have not e-invoicing, but this is very much paper-based invoicing. In the EU, well, they do have CMR, but this is also uh, e-based there. So you just need to have the uh, contract, the e-invoice, and documents to confirm supplies, uh, the contracts arrangements with the transporting company. And the difference that we have in Ukraine now regarding the situation in some EU member states, not all of them, of course, because we are very much ahead of a lot of EU member states, if we speak about how we document those relationships. For example, since August, we are planning to, uh, for example, uh, experiment with implementing ETTN, and that's something that is very much required if we want to achieve true e-invoicing, where the invoices will be equal to tax reporting, so that businesses did not have to register those heaps of paper that are not needed from the point of view of business relations or from the point of view of the state's control of businesses. So that's about reducing costs of businesses in compliance and to keep an eye on fraud. On one of the sites, there was the reference to those provisions of the directive in Europe, all this, each project, each presentation, well, they they, um, these two components go hand in hand. But first of all, we need to reduce business costs and uh, we need to fight fraud and we need to make our best to prevent tax fraud. In this aspect, Ukraine is very efficiently fighting tax fraud due to our tax and uh, invoices, uh, but some costs, uh, business costs are severely affected. Unfortunately, even if you consider the investigation that was uh, recently held uh, by the business ombudsperson of Ukraine, the number of businesses that suffer negative consequences of uh, dealing with the tax administration in the system for e-registration of tax bills, well, they were beyond criticism. Now the situation is a bit different, but it is still very far from what's expected and from the political goals announced by the authorities regarding the burden on business, this costs for business compliance. In order to achieve the degree of fighting fraud that the state is aiming and the degree of mobilization of tax funds that the uh, state requires. So the main message that the Council of Business Ombudsperson would like to convey is that we always need to keep in mind the balance in these relations. And just as in the EU, we need to focus above all on reducing business costs, not so much fighting fraud at the expense of all businesses that are there. That's an important aspect. And the current uh, actual business costs for any innovation for every harmonization or uh, amend, uh, amendment in legislation needs to be analyzed and set together with businesses. 
it's not okay and business ombudsperson cannot agree to the situation where the Ministry of Finance writes the analysis of regulatory impact and all of a sudden they say that every business uh, spends uh, to submit information about the suspended uh, bills only like uh, half an hour and the tax authorities they spend like three hours actually um, it takes about 12 hours or more so businesses waste their entire time to prepare paper documents to confirm that they are actual business that they do implement transactions there is the logic where in the state 50 percent of suspended uh, bills are correctly suspended if uh, businesses do not submit any confirmation background for that but the other 50 percent of businesses that uh, actually suffer because the state does not have risk-oriented approach a balanced approach understanding business costs uh, to ensure compliance so that's a huge problem and that's our key message is again that all the mm, activities are implemented in view of business costs for to make it clear what's expected from businesses and how to cut the costs thank you Kirill. thank you so much for your very interesting and spot on statements and i also see that maria has joined us maria senek senior lecturer of legal uh, department of Lutsk university welcome Hi, Natalia, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. And as far as I understand, you have not heard uh, the previous speakers. I did hear them, very interesting presentation by Yuri and other participants of the round table. That's great. So then, if you don't mind, let's proceed with the question to you. What's your vision of the progress of integration of the Ukrainian tax system, especially in the part of VAT and the excise duties to the EU, and what are the challenges? Thank you for this question. Unfortunately, I have to say that for the tax system of Ukraine, well, I cannot comment that because I have not been in touch with that for a long period of time. I can only speak about the EU VAT system, what it looks like and the principles and the key processes that take part there. And maybe I could add a little bit about how much freedom, apart from those uh, aspects that Yuri mentioned today. So what are other possibilities for maneuvering for member states. Let me just uh, interrupt you very briefly. We've invited Maria Senek because I really like her very deep, profound research and publications that uh, cover the essence of the European VAT system. And uh, she goes much deeper, delves much deeper than what can be found on the surface. So we look forward to that. Thank you, Yuri. And thank you for your invitation. So let's start by highlighting the general features of the current VAT system in the EU. And let me reiterate some principles behind this system and Yuri mostly mentioned them already and this is the principle of the um, country of destination and the main idea is that all transactions that happen in the territory of the EU supplies of goods and services that they are supposed to be taxed uh, uh, subject to taxation in the territory of the EU this is the duty for member states to taxate uh, to apply taxes to these transactions but we shouldn't forget about another principle, common market principle, that makes it possible for consumers to travel in the territory of the EU to buy goods and services in other countries and pay VAT in the country where they purchase them goods. And, but there are exceptions to that principle 
that's about new cars, for example, because when a consumer buys a new car in another EU state, uh, the VAT is paid in their home country. And this was done in order not to uh, prevent competition in the single market. There are also exceptions uh, for small businesses that do trade with other EU member states. In particular, that's about supplies of uh, services, TB services, telecommunication, electronic and broadcasting services or uh, remote sales of goods, they have the opportunity for that if, well, these transactions until a certain limit, they can pay VAT in the state where they actually are. So they don't have to pay VAT in all the countries where they final the end users are that undertake the burden of that tax. But actually, if we consider all the changes that are happening in the EU now, we see that soon this principle of the destination country will dominate and even even in the field of trade, uh, B2B trade uh, in various EU countries. I also would like to say that the system itself is very well harmonized, uh, sufficiently harmonized, due to this, uh, due to that this is a common market and direct and direct taxes are directly uh, influencing the competition. And there is another reason. This reason is that a part of a taxable base each country collects goes to EU budget. There is a rate 0.3% uh, which is uh, transferred to EU budget. So it's very important for this uh, taxation base to be harmonized. But uh, nevertheless, there are some opportunities for maneuvering. I will dwell on them a little bit. Natalia, please uh, let me know when my time is over <laughs> for me to stop speaking. Yes, thank you. Also, I would like to say that uh, the system is in a transformation process. It started a long time ago. I don't want to lie, but uh, maybe in 2009, long time ago, the system, certain first processes started when the a vision came that the system should be changed. And as of today, it is now being in harmonization process and in the process of change. Can you hear me? It seems to be you cannot see me, but we can hear you. Okay, then I will continue. So, looking on one side, there is a, an attempt to make the system simpler, to simplify the rules for business who are collecting tax from the consumers to pay it to the budget. Also, there is an attempt to simplify the system of trade between EU member countries. Also, Yuri, including Yuri today, named this one-stop shop uh, single window to ease the businesses who sell their goods and services in other EU countries to, uh, for them to be able to pay tax in the place of their registration and the location where the company is found, not to have a need to be registered for this tax in different countries of European Union. But basically, I might tell you that the rules are rather complicated, although there is an attempt to simplify them. But my personal opinion is they don't become easier. New special mechanisms are appearing. One of them regards imports, the so-called import one-stop shop, meaning the goods which are imported to European Union and which are bought remotely. There is another mechanism regarding the so-called non-union scheme. When 
the suppliers of uh, services which are located outside the EU do provide the services to the consumers found inside the EU. They have the possibility to choose any country in the EU and to pay this tax in one country, not in all the countries. And there is another system uh, called uh, so-called union scheme, which is used for the companies who also sell goods remotely to other country to other EU countries or provide services which uh, with uh, the place of supply in other EU countries. They also have a possibility to choose this scheme. Also, I will mention a couple of words about the future system. The current system regards uh, regarding the trade between EU countries is a transition one, as you already mentioned, and has to be changed basically as a so to so called definitive system, VAT system. But uh, currently, the last changes there was a proposal from Euro Commission in. 1218 and later on it was adopted by Parliament in 2019 and now the, uh, accepted by Parliament. but uh, EU Council hasn't yet uh, accepted it in the DAP, so nothing happens in this area. There are many other changes, if I have time I'll tell about them, but I would like to tell a few words about the freedom of activity, of actions or space for maneuvering which remains for EU member countries. Yuri mentioned about derogations. Today I will not tell, talk about them. I'd like to say about the provisions of the directive. Most of them are imperative, but there are some provisions which are dispositive, which provide possibility to the countries, EU member countries, to choose certain options. I just uh, would like to give certain examples. I will not talk about tax rates because it was already discussed today. For example, the application of a market price for taxation base determination main rule the taxation based from each uh, supply of goods and services is the price as a supplier receives from the buyer it doesn't matter the company would buy goods for 100 grivna so to say and sells them at 50 grivna that doesn't matter because VAT will be calculated for, uh, based upon 50 grivna but there is such an option if this transaction is between related persons then there is possibility to apply market price. I am said my time is over now. The last I would like to say today is the electronic commerce, e-commerce, not to talk about VAT in the digital age, because it was already mentioned a lot about it, but just a few words about the role of marketplaces or other platforms in uh, VT collection. There have been certain changes, a uh, part of those became effective in 2019, another part in 2021, but the matter is uh, if the goods, certain goods are sold, also the services, but the change concerns first of all the goods. If they are sold through a certain platform, or the platform participates in supply of goods to final consumers, then this uh, same platform has the commitment to collect VAT from the consumer and to transfer it to the budget. What's interesting is this uh, obligation covers not only uh, the platforms registered in the EU, but also those outside of the EU. And there are different mechanisms how to do it, but uh, here I will uh, wrap up my short presentation be because I can talk endlessly on this topic, but there are other speakers as well. Thank you. Maria, thank you very much for your participation. I just want to make two 
brief remarks. As regards time frame work for implementation of a definitive uh, VAT taxation system in Europe, how the Commission assess them? It uh, shows remarkably by the fact that in many transition provisions, there's a statement for that up to 2030 euros or implementation of a different system what comes yearly. So we can understand this rather long horizon of implementation. Thank you for mentioning non-scheme VT one stop shop for outside EU suppliers. It has it is first of all interesting for our business working for European market before we will integrate into this common market. We have to study it, search, research the opportunities they are there. They are brought and sometimes confused, but they may be used. Yuri, may I comment as regards the movement towards this definitive system? Basically, I do share or a sceptical attitude to those time to that time frame of when could it be made and i want to say that basically one of those problems why it eventually doesn't happen is uh, that uh, when transitioning to this new system uh, the application of vat for transactions between businesses, uh, first of all, those are goods which are being transported between EU countries. So now, that applies to that. Now there is a change of taxation for region, originating country and the destination country. So the transaction was split into two parts, and then each um, country will decide how to apply or not apply this exemption. According to destination country also um, has an opportunity to establish its uh, tax rate. But with the new system, there will be a one single transaction. It will be supply of goods not exempted from taxation. It will be taxed. But it will be taxed at VAT tax in rate in a destination country, but the country where supply is, is obligated to get to charge the tax and to transfer it to destination country bank. And it uh, leads to that uh, you member countries depend a lot upon how uh, other you member countries will collect, will charge the tax which belongs to them. But I believe uh, that system is developing and this, this transition will happen sooner or later, but not so quickly. Thank you, Yuri and Maria, for such an interesting discussion. I would like to remind our audience, please put your questions uh, to Q&A session or raise your hands. We'll be happy to give you an opportunity to ask uh, the question alive in voice. Before us, that, uh, I want to ask a question to uh, Alexander, which we discussed uh, so many interesting options for administering for uh, about administration of taxes on the EU. And we also discussed that the problematic issues of a Ukrainian taxation system integration into EU is due to certain non-proved or non-justified expectations of business. But can we say what is good and what will be well appreciated and accepted by the business uh, and what should and has sense to be implemented for Ukrainian economics right now to reduce and mitigate future shocks from your integration? Danilo Alexandrovich, can you hear us? Eventually. Okay, let us wait for Danilo Alexandrovich will join in a couple of minutes. Now, the same question goes to you, Yuri. What you would see in VAT and taxation tax in uh, European Union we could borrow right now? 
I believe two aspects are worth mentioning by me. This is a moment to flexibility of rates, a well thoughtful moment, well thought moment, which allows to address the specifics of each business segments and uh, the role for economics and the society. We have to remember the Euro Commission in all its decisions is guided, first of all, by a deep analysis based upon what will it bring to the society and only after the business. And the second point, the mechanism of agreement of review of uh, privileges, so all those exemptions, uh, derogations, being improved, all of them are temporary. And uh, their prolongation uh, requires uh, in-depth analysis each time. Certain derogations foresee, for example, what I briefly described for uh, alcohol excises as regards reduction or exemption of those excesses or exemption from the success of uh, small regional manufacturers. I detailed this in detail in this report. They may have a problem with large cost of uh, the raw material if they are located in remote regions and it's difficult for them to get to the market due to difficult logistics. Any such derogations do require that a member country would conduct assessment each two to three years and how the structure of a cost changed in this industry, how much these privileges are reasonable for future use, are they needed or no, how does they influence the internal market. So there is a careful attitude to um, privileges, not to, throw, not to throw them to right and to the left, but every time when they expire, to prolong them, there should be a serious uh, substantiation uh, of their need for the economics and uh, society. I like very much this approach. I, I believe this approach should be transferred to Ukraine into our euro policy. We are not to avoid uh, euro integration, but the faster the best, the better it would be made. I would like to remark also, the more you immerse into the system, and Maria mentioned about it, the more you understand uh, how untrivial is uh, to integrate uh, into the taxation system of uh, 27 countries, maybe 28 already, to make it work as a common market without burden as the businesses, uh, so, the so that the advantages would of, from working on such a large market would prevail over uh, drawbacks like reverse charging and so on. So it is uh, quite uh, not an easy story. Super, thank you, Yuri, for your comments. After looking at the questions in chat, we had a question for a preservation of uh, privileges for uh, VAT for uh, eco-industrial parks participants. Danilo is not present with us, he could answer this question. Also, there was another question as regards the next future changes in taxation system also would best be answered by Mr. Gutmann. So, uh, Kirillo, let us ask you, we have discussed the changes which would be interesting to borrow to the European taxation system already now. Might you see certain other issues we would borrow? And also, what is your vision about how should we implement them at the best in time or from communication point of view? So to provide optimally the observation of uh, the rights of business and also the interests of the state. Thank you for your question. would like to draw your attention that I have seen a raised hand by Tatiana Potopalska in the chat. She is participant of one of the VAT working group. I propose to give the floor to her. I believe she may inform us something interesting on this issue. So answering your question, 
about what Ukraine may already do. Really, the rules in EU are not easy. So to implement something totally unknown for the Ukrainian legal system, justice system and law enforcement system may cost a lot because each legal provision has its life cycle. So uh, before four to five years to pass to understand definitely how to use it, it may create a number of problems in the regulation. Accordingly, if you're asking what should we begin with, I believe we should begin uh, from with something that Ukraine is successful in, but uh, to implement it at the maximum under uh, EU principles. The system is in court. Digitalization is what Ukraine is successful at. In invoicing, by the way, can be an objective in Ukraine. We have the draft law to implement e invoices instead of completion acts. There is the draft law. I don't remember the number of it. Uh, you can search for it, and or I will search for it, and I will notify you. But the idea is to replace the completion acts uh, with one invoice that will be submitted in the electronic form and this transition from the um, e invoices to, uh, to e uh, tax bills to one e invoice that will be checked uh, online uh, by the tax administration and your counterparty this is something that i believe well i am rather a lawyer and i see these problems from the point of view of a lawyer but definitely that will uh, cut costs and that will significantly facilitate organization of relations between the supplier, buyer and the tax service. That will simplify administration and speed up administration as well as fighting. Uh, it will help us fight fraud. So if you combine all of that, e-invoicing, moving towards the single custom system with the EU single data hub and their forms of documents and ECMR. Or ETTN for us. All of that can provide significantly more mechanisms, tools uh, for tax administration to uh, fight fraud, and it will simplify uh, the in business process as it will be. The transactions will be simplified, and compared to the current situation, it will be like paradise because the current situation where last year 50% of businesses had to incur some negative consequences and to prove to tax administration that they are not fictitious companies, that's not normal. Businesses must not waste time for this administration. Uh, I mean, proper businesses. If these are fraudulent businesses, that's fair, of course. Then it is important to suspend their tax bills and to uh, suspend these businesses. But one needs to understand that it needs to be pro proportional. Proportionality, this is one of key principles for administering, not only tax administration, but administering all in all in the EU. So the, this needs to be the this uh, activities need to be in line with the goal, and that needs to be proportionate. Meaning that not um, it's impossible that all businesses have to suffer in Ukraine, where fifty percent of businesses have to um, face the human factor or submit their tax bills or to prove that they are producers of that product that they can sell these products to counterparties. Well, now this doesn't look as something normal, but digitalization, AI, this is where Ukraine already has some achievements and can make a significant leap. Thank you so much for your statements. And Tatiana, we will be happy to pass the floor to you for your question. Hello, dear colleagues. I would like to not so much ask a question, but 
as a fact that has been mentioned today. And this is the problem for Ukrainian businesses, where they believe that lower rates result in some improvements for doing business. Because uh, the surveys of international organizations, OECD in Ukraine, for example, indicate that lower or beneficial tax rates result in more difficult taxation, administration, and far not every business can um, stand that. And as mentioned today during the presentation, small and medium businesses usually cannot administer the processes in such a way that they are sure that they are doing everything correctly. In view of that, I believe that the main principle of the EU is to count when implementing the benefits or reduce rates as mentioned by the speakers today. That's a good message. We must not say that in the EU, everybody has some derogation or benefits. No, they have that based on some rationale on certain e arguments where all the items are considered on the part of the business and the state, and then the decision is made. Regarding the general picture, I agree that this is a bit different philosophy for taxation and administering indirect taxes. And there, I believe, we have not yet mentioned today the revised philosophy of uh, control authorities and uh, from the perspective of the taxpayers. And number three, as mentioned today, what has not been mentioned for businesses, I believe that the judicial practice for tax administration that they have in the European court and that is applied by all countries simultaneously and in the same way, that that's going to be the best ground to avoid risks regarding incorrect tax administration if we implement European rules in the territory of Ukraine, and I do believe that we will introduce them. So I believe that we can expect significant intellectual and uh, uh, actual works, but if we understand that this is a different philosophy, we are moving somewhere. Thank you, Tatiana. And let me remind you that you can also ask questions to other participants of the discussion. I see we had a question here in the chat, which Yuri has already addressed in the chat. Okay, and since so far I don't see any new questions, Yuri, I will pass the floor to you for your final words. Right, and let me comment a little bit because this is an important question. So the question from Bogdan Kostyuk is about the presumption of uh, guilt of the tax player. This is something that can be discussed, but above all, this is about tax administration. And let me emphasize that the way how the state administers taxes, so far in the EU, this remains upon discretion of member states. And so with this VAT digital age uh, amendments to changes when certain standards for digital reporting on, uh, uh, on VAT transaction will be introduced there, the frame will be a bit narrower, but building the service function of the tax administration approach to audit, control, that's something that is the prerogative of the domestic policy of the member state, and it will be so for a while. So if there are no more questions or comments, let me express my gratitude for you being here, because, well, taxes, taxation system, this is one of fundamental aspects of uh, the public contract, of course, that to a great extent determines dynamics of the processes in Ukraine, where they are moving, to what extent the citizens trust the state, the priorities, that's very important. And we need to be ready for the European integration process 
to make sure that it is as soft, as mild as possible to make use of this opportunity that is exists once in a lifetime so that in the process of accession negotiations we could emphasize those aspects that we need not based on lobbyism to make it favorable for some businesses that better are better organized than others but to consider what will create the best community effect for our economy in general for a resilient sustainability of the state well obviously we will not be admitted to the eu where there is this hot phase of the war but further on we need to think about the resilience of the state and where there is resilience where there is trust among the main stakeholders citizens entrepreneurs and public institutions that represent the will of citizens that's going to be the main guarantee of that we will be resilient to external threats so we are grateful to everyone who showed their interest and um, let's move on and work in this direction in our specific areas and i pass the floor to natalia and thank you natalia for moderating today's event i'm also grateful to you and we are grateful to all the speakers there who have joined as uh, Danilo, Maria, Andri, Carillo, we are grateful. And also follow us, follow the next events of the Center for Economic Strategy. Join us and follow the reports of the Center. I wish you all the best and see you at our next interesting discussion. Have a good